Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, hopefully, speaking to a room of fishery scientists, I don't really need to convince you that knowing what the sex of the fish you collect out in the wild is important. But I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of that and tell you how we've done some in investigations on validating the, the field sex identification for paddlefish in Oklahoma. So sex for us, at least for paddlefish research, is pretty critical. Um, it's, it's important in life history. As you can see, we have kind of sexually sized dimorphic species. Females reach a larger maximum size. They grow at some different rates. Also, their maturation and reproduction is vastly different between sexes. Males uh, sexually mature at age five, females sexually mature at age eight. Um, so as you can see that, their gonad weight rel uh, relative to body weight is quite different for females. So of course that sort of contributes to why they get so large versus the males. Also, they, they store their energy in gonadal fat bodies, so just fat deposits surrounding the gonads. And we see very different characteristics between males and females. Males will have substantially more fat, of course, because females are uh, investing that energy in egg production. Uh, knowing sex is also important when you, when you consider behavior. Uh, this is an example from sturgeon where the males, like the paddlefish, sexually mature earlier than the females and they have kind of a uh, spawning interval. So incrementally throughout their lifetime, they're making movements upstream to spawn. And it's important for us as resource managers with a uh, snag fishery, so what fish are gonna be vulnerable when? Uh, and that varies between the sexes because like I said, males mature at five, so they're going upstream and they can be caught. Whereas male, females are not maturing until eight, so they got three year wait before they're really vulnerable to snagging. Well, within the sturgeons and paddlefish in general, it's pretty difficult to assign sex from external morphology. Here's an example. These are some shovel nose sturgeon we caught in the Arkansas River. They're virtually identical. Uh, they don't have that sexual, sexual size dimorphism. They don't really have characters where you can look at them and simply say that's a female or a male. So to overcome some of these challenges, sturgeon researchers in general will do one of several techniques and these vary from fairly invasive to less invasive, one being just cut a hole in the fish and see if it has eggs. Um, that's something that's done in commercial fishing quite often. Or you can use a biopsy needle, maybe a little less invasive, um, using a, you know, a marinade injector works fairly well, we've done that. Uh, of course, more complicated stuff like endoscopy, uh, blood draws, looking at hormones to determine sex. And then of course, ultrasound. All these are fairly complex, much more complex than simply looking at the fish and saying, oh, that's a male. We're very fortunate in Oklahoma that we don't have things that challenging. We can generally look at our, our paddlefish and determine whether it's a male or female. And we have a couple rules of thumb. First is body shape. As you can see these two examples, the top one is a male and the bottom one is a female. They're pretty close to the same length, pretty close to the same age. They look really similar, except of course the female is more robust. As you can see, that, that male is 17 years old and only weighs 16.7 kilograms, and the female is 14 years old, but weighs substantially more at 24. One of the more important characters though, other than body shape, because as we, as we saw, uh, they can accumulate fat and that's what impacts their body, body shape and size. Um, there's an external character of tubercles. And if you're not familiar with that, it's, just, it's simply a keratinized tactile organ or little goosebumps on the fish, typically on the head area of fish and typically uh, only, only seen in males. Well, unfortunately, both of these characters are, are not really binary for paddlefish. We do see a lot of females with tubercles and we see a lot of fat males. Uh, so to further complicate that, you, you think about younger fish. Well, a younger female fish can be identical to a mature male fish. So in the field, that can complicate the accuracy of sex identification. So a little more detail on these tubercles. They're the white goosebumps. This is the head of the paddlefish. 
Here is the opercle where they continue. Here's the dorsal surface, dorsal fin, and then the caudal fin. It's, it's difficult to see, but between these fin rays, you've got all these little white dots. Those are tubercles. And this is a mature male. So we wanted to take a look at how accurate are we at sex ID. Uh, just simply observing the fish in the field, assigning a sex, and then validating that later. So of course we have lots of wild capture events in which we assign an individual band code so we know that fish uh, throughout its lifespan. We assign sex, we release it, and then some of those fish are later caught by anglers. And because we, we monitor our harvest fishery quite closely, we have the opportunity to later examine the, the internal organs of that fish, validate the sex. So we can take a retrospective over the 10 years that we've been doing this and we've accumulated 643 fish where we can, we can look at our accuracy of field sex identification. Um, and of course we can also back calculate what was the age at which we assigned that sex and we know the length that it was at capture. Turns out we're, we're somewhat accurate, pretty good, considering that you know you can't tell a male from a female sturgeon. 81% uh, of the time we accurately sexed females and 87% of the time we accurately sexed males. And of course that accuracy varies by age of the fish and the size of the fish. So looking at age, of course, you know, older, mature fish are reproductive. So they're gonna, they're gonna have those reproductive characteristics like a larger body size for females or lots of tubercles for males. But if we look at length as well, um, I just wanted to point out that to be 80% accurate for males and females, there's a difference in length of, a, of 10 centimeters. Uh, so we are much less accurate, as you can see, for young, small females than we are for equivalent size in males. And that's because they mature at earlier life, uh, earlier point in life. Well, this seems like a, a pretty good accuracy, 87%, 81%. However, there's a challenge to that. Uh, paddlefish reproduce episodically. And that basically means we have huge recruitment booms separated by long periods of reproductive drought. Uh, so for example, this is 2004, where we had a cohort that's five years old, basically dominating the catch. And then again, uh, six years later, this is the harvest that same cohort is dominating the harvest. So for, for several years, we may not be able to accurately sex those fish, uh, regardless of how many we catch. So if we're making management decisions, it, it makes sense to understand a little bit better what, what sex these fish are. So we're looking for ways to enhance the accuracy of that for smaller fish. So as an example, at a 750 millimeter fish, we're 62% accurate for males but only 11% accurate for females. So we, we really want to try to uh, address that. So that kind of brings me to the point of this whole talk. We did a pilot study looking at tubercles. Like I said, we do have a lot of females with tubercles. I was trained that if it has tubercles, it's a male, and we know that is absolutely not true. Um, but the ideal scenario we want to have here is to, to find a binary sex ID character. Males have this, females don't. And that's really going to increase our accuracy in assigning sex in the field. So we hypothesized that maybe tubercle location could be a better indicator of sex or of maleness, of course. So we looked at 239 fish from the harvest where we could validate sex from internal organs and we recorded where on the body they possess tubercles. Pretty simple experiment, right? Well, we found, as I said, now, throughout the presentation, males will be represented by blue and females are yellow, just for shorthand here. Um, of course, the rostrum and head is a, is a terrible location to look at tubercles and say, is that a male or female? However, when we go to the opercles, they're starting to separate out. So we're getting closer to that ideal scenario where only males have tubercles and females don't. We expand that to the different fins we're even closer to what our goal, our objective here was. For example, we look at the caudal fin. 92% of males had, had tubercles on the caudal fin, but only 10% of females. So if we, 
extrapolate that out and we look at that, that is our character where we determine what sex it is, uh, our accuracy is going to go up. So for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to skip the Rosterman head. I'm just going to focus on these characters to the right. So let's, let's take that little experiment and apply it to a field, right? So here's kind of the probability logic. You're in the field, you caught a paddlefish, or, or you caught it on a hook. Either way, it still applies. Does it have tubercles on that caudal fin? So it's either going to be a yes or no answer. So if it's yes, because tubercles are an indicator of maleness, you would logically call it a male. If it does not, you would logically call it a female. Follow me? That makes pretty good sense, I think. Well, of course, it's not that cut and dry. Most of the time you might be correct, but then sometimes you're going to be incorrect. Likewise, if you call it a female, most of the time you're going to be correct, but sometimes you're not. Well, if we look at each of those characters, each of those fins, and we, we run these numbers and we say, what percent of the time are we correct? What percent of the time are we incorrect? For both scenarios, then we can sort of evaluate holistically which character is the best indicator of maleness and the best uh, to use for sex identification. So if we do that, we can sort of compare all these, char all these characters together. <clears throat> but we also want to know how accurate is that particular location. So we want to integrate both the accuracy for males and the accuracy for females. So with probabilities, you would simply multiply those, which results in the, the numbers on the bottom here, where we see that the caudal fin has the highest probability of success compared to the other fins at accurately indicating sex, whether or not pre the tubercles are present or absent. But you can also notice that these numbers are pretty similar. I mean, there's not a whole lot of deviance from caudal fin to dorsal fin. So why not just use dorsal fin? So we wanted to dig down into that a little bit different. Again, this was our objective where we have uh, high incidence of, for males and close to zero for females. But in reality, no matter what, we're going to get something more like this. So if we take into account the difference between males and 100 and the difference between females and zero, that sort of encapsulates our uncertainty for that, that particular character. So I created something I'm just calling an uncertainty index, um, where you just combine those two, those two numbers and we look at all of these characters again. Turns out the caudal fin has the lowest amount of uncertainty, so it sort of validates what we saw earlier where Although the caudal fin was only slightly better than, say, the dorsal fin, it, it continues to come out on top. Now, of course, we have exceptions to normal reproductive development. We see lots of sterile fish. We see non-gravid fish. We see um, deformities. We've seen some male fish that had five gallons of gonadal fat inside them. Now, if you don't think they look like a female with that much fat in them, uh, you should see it. It's pretty amazing. And then this, this last year, we actually observed two intersex fish, which I don't really have time to go into. However, that basically amounted to an ovary growing out of the testy of a fish. So how do, you, how do you accurately field sex something like that? Luckily, it's extremely rare. So we're now revising our rules of thumb. We're going to continue the sex validation study. Um, because we, have, we had a major spawning event in 2015, we have quite a few young fish in the stock that we're catching, and we need a way to accurately field sex ID those fish for the long term. Um, and we're going to continue to, to record the presence and absence of tubercles on fish. With that, I'd be happy to take a question. Yes, sir. If you could uh, uh, perhaps focus on this, but just one thing. I knew that question was going to come up, and that's, that's, that's valid. What would be the combined probability of if, if it has tubercles on the caudal and the dorsal, for example? And I haven't run those numbers yet. Um, this seems to be fairly straightforward and simple, and I, I will do that. So um, you're right, that, that might be a better formula for success.
<coughs> so on uh, various like cyprinid fishes, you have like sexual dimorphism um, developed in like cubicles, um, like nest building. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You don't see this really uh, in the paddle fish. So I was one, wondering if like you kind of understand like the function of these cubicles on these fish. That's also a good question. Uh, there's not a whole lot of literature on observations of spawning paddlefish because their habitat's typically pretty turbid water. Uh, so we don't really know whether it's a, a vestigial character or if they're actually using it to stimulate the females. Like I said, the females also have them on the head area. So it's a little kind of confusing compared to what you'd normally expect. Jason. No, I only, you know, investigated it sort of as an example within this presentation. Um, but yeah, that, like I said, for sturgeon, it's a little more difficult. And fortunately, with experience, I would say that my accuracy is probably better than the mean we have. That's taking into account different field crews over a decade. Um, so with, with practice and experience, we're probably higher in the 90s as far as success. And I don't think that necessarily warrants doing blood tests for several thousand fish every winter when we're sampling. Yes? So what kind of harvest is there on the uh, paddle I mean, Like, Is it also commercial harvest or is it just agriculture? We, in Oklahoma, we only have recreational snag harvest. And it seems to be sustainable so far? Or yes, we're, it's very tightly regulated in our state. Talked kind of fast, I guess. Yeah. Of course, you're cutting into your next talk, so. I don't care. <laughs> well, thanks.